Center's webinar series, uh, providing demonstrations to support and guide the development of your telehealth program, presented on the third Thursday of each month. Next slide. Um, located throughout the country, Joe, can you flip to the next slide? There you go. Located throughout the country, the 12 regional telehealth resource centers, supported by two national resource centers, serve as focal points for advancing the effective use of telehealth and supporting access to telehealth services in rural and underserved communities. Next slide. So I am Kathy Wiberly, Director of the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center and the sponsor of today's presentation, um, entitled Things to Consider When Developing a Credentialing and Privileging Process for Telehealth. It is being presented by Joe Tracy, Vice President of Telehealth Services at Lehigh Valley Health Network and consultative service partner for the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center. So with that said, I will go ahead and punt to Joe for the presentation. Oh, I, okay, I unmuted myself. I think that will help. Um, can somebody give me a nod and let me know the audio is working? I'm good. Okay. It is, it is All, right. The All right, well, uh, I'll get started then. Uh, Kathy, thanks for asking me to do this presentation for everyone. Um, just so everybody knows, I'm, I'm in my 22nd year of doing telehealth services. I saw one promotion of this talk that said I was a pioneer. Uh, I prefer to call myself uh, just, uh, I'm a guy that's part of the Telehealth Historical Society. And um, so I, I'm gonna go through this talk, keep that in mind uh, that I've just been around a long time. Um, so at the end of this talk, you should be able to describe and discuss the history of telehealth in terms of cred credentialing and privileging and of course be able to uh, potentially implement a model that's used by at least one large hub site, which would be. Okay, and in terms of a disclaimer, I just wanna let everybody know I am not an attorney, okay? Uh, this is discussion about how one institution has simply implemented a credentialing and privileging process for telehealth. If you've joined via a computer, enter your participant ID followed by the pound or hash sign. Otherwise, just press pound or hash to continue. Kathy, is there a way to get that person muted? Or Becky? Okay, I'll continue. Um, in other words, this, is, this talk is not intended to serve as legal advice. Please seek the advice of your legal counsel and medical staff services department when setting up your credentialing and privileging process for telehealth. So let me give you a little history um, at this point so you know where this, uh, where this has come from. Uh, in, the, in the mid to late 90s, um, a lot of us had a wake-up call uh, when we realized as we did telehealth between hospitals, how in the world were we going to credential and privilege uh, a lot of physicians in very small hospitals? And uh, at that point, we, uh, we actually met with and had a long discussion with the group that was then known as the Joint Commission on the Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, or JCO, uh, as they were affectionately called, now just called the Joint Commission. Uh, we talked with Dr. Paul Shivey, Dr. Robert Wise, uh, many people, probably some of you that have, are maybe on this call today had those conversations about how can we make it simple for the remote sites uh, to credential and privilege uh, the doctors uh, that will be providing telehealth services to those facilities. And the Joint Commission was actually the group that really set up the first delegated credentialing process for uh, telehealth. And, and that was way back again in the, in the mid to late 90s when we did that. And then we fast forward to 2008, uh, almost 10 years down the road. 
um, some of us got wind of the fact that the Joint Commission, uh, their deeming authority under the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services was up for renewal, for lack of a better term. And there were two things at that time that concerned um, CMS in terms of giving the deeming authority to the Joint Commission, or, uh, or I guess re-awarding deeming authority to the Joint Commission. And one of those things uh, was credentialing and privileging for telehealth. And uh, so we were all concerned with that because CMS did not see credentialing and privileging for telehealth in the same, the same way that the Joint Commission saw it. The Center for the CMS thought we should continue to do full credentialing and privileging for providers that were using telehealth. Well, many of us had already been using that process that was established by the Joint Commission in the 90s uh, where we were doing it in a delegated manner, making it much more affordable and much easier to do. Um, so what we did was we basically alerted uh, then the late Bob Waters, uh, who now name is on the Center for Telehealth and eHealth Law uh, uh, Association. So we alerted Bob and got together as a group and said, what is this gonna do to telehealth if we have to do full credentialing and privileging. And basically from most of the big hubs whose physicians would be the ones credentialed and privileged, it was really going to have a, a negative impact to the point where many sites were basically saying, if we have to do this, we will shut telehealth down. We cannot afford the time and the expense of credentialing hundreds of phys physicians in many small rural hospitals uh, to provide telehealth services. So we went into action through the center for, for well, it's effectively called CTEL. And we had some very well-placed individuals in the state of Virginia, um, namely Dr. Karen Ruban, who knew uh, a gentleman by the name of Anish Chopra, Chofra at the time. And Anish just happened to be President Obama's first chief technology officer. And we felt that we probably needed to have a conversation with him uh, about this uh, simply because CMS is an agency. The CTO uh, was an appointed person that uh, represents the chief technology office. We thought maybe with his help, we could get to somebody in CMS to let them know what the real impact of full credentialing would be on telehealth across the country. Uh, we had that conversation with Anish, uh, and later there was a subsequent meeting held at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville with CMS and others uh, to discuss, um, I guess, the negative impact full credentialing would have. Uh, after that meeting, uh, interestingly enough, CMS agreed uh, with our points in terms of we really need to have a model for delegated credentialing and privileging of telehealth so that we could continue doing what we're doing and uh, improve access to care. So in around 2010, uh, CMS came out with a proposed uh, regulation. They opened it up for a comment period. Uh, that went by the wayside and led to a new regulation in the Code of Federal Regulations for Telehealth Credentialing and Privileging. And that is what we enjoy today. And in a sense, the Joint Commission's early work uh, in the late, mid to late 90s was actually adopted by CMS to some extent, allowing hospitals who were participating in the Medicare program to actually do delegated credentialing and privileging for telehealth services. So that's a brief history. It's come a long way. It's, this is not a new concept. Uh, I don't think most of us probably knew uh, the relationship between the Joint Commission and, and the Joint uh, and CMS at that time uh, for telehealth, but we certainly do now. And uh, we really appreciate CMS and the Joint Commission's work to allow us to do this uh, to do delegated credentialing and privileging. So this is just a reference slide. Uh, if you are unaware of this, you probably want to look this information up, give it to your attorneys, your medical staff services. Um, but it's in the, uh, it's the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. They amended 42 Code of Federal Regulations, Chapter 4, 
Part 482 for conditions of participation for hospitals. So as I go through the slides and you see COP or COP, that stands for conditions of participation. That will have all of the detail that you need uh, from a legal or regulatory standpoint to help push your, um, your process forward. But you really need to review that and be careful doing so. So as I, as I move forward here with my discussion in terms of how we are doing delegated credentialing um, at Lehigh Valley, I just want, I got a point of clarification to make sure everyone knows how we are doing this to provide inpatient consultations or how we provide inpatient consultations or emergency-based co uh, consultations with our partners. Uh, we, uh, we have a true consultative model. Our, prof our providers make formal recommendations to the physicians uh, at the remote sites or at the originating sites. We do not place orders and we do not assume responsibility for the direct patient, for direct patient care. That stays in the hands of the physicians at those remote hospitals. So how do, we, how do we use the telehealth requirements laid out by CMS? Well, our first step always is when we're meeting with a site is you're having that general telehealth discussion uh, in terms of what services they would like uh, for us to provide. And in that process, we talk about telehealth credentialing and privileging, um, mainly to try to assess whether or not uh, the small hospital or the smaller hospitals um, medical staff bylaws allow for this type of uh, credentialing and privileging. And uh, you can tell pretty quick if the bylaws don't, uh, because you always get a funny look, like you want us to do what? Um, you know, we want to basically delegate the credentialing to Lehigh Valley Health Network. So we, we talk about that a little bit, and then we talk about our credentialing and privileging agreement with them. Uh, which will require a change to the originating site's medical staff bylaws if they, if they don't already allow for it. Um, we have a provider request and application form. We do an electronic review of the provider credentials, and there's also the privileging process. And so we're gonna go through each one of these uh, through this presentation. So the mod, what we do is we'll typically come back from our visit with a remote site and I will send them, uh, if, they, if I know they do not have uh, a, something in their bylaws regarding telehealth, I will send them some model language for developing a medical staff category for telehealth. And in that, we, it'll talk about the staff qualifications of, of our physicians. We will define what we mean by consulting telemedicine privileges. And we will define limitations that we place on, on this process as well. And we're gonna spend a little time on that uh, in terms of uh, why those limitations are important for both sites. I, I threw this slide in at this point um, in terms of where you demo um, the process because a lot of people do not initially get the idea of delegated credentialing and privileging. They don't get the idea of being able to electronically review uh, the physician information that we hold electronically. And so you have to kind of gauge, do you do this on your first visit so that they can better understand what you're doing and when they see it, they know what they need to do with their bylaws? Or do you wait until after all the contracts have been signed and, uh, um, and you've got that credentialing and privileging agreement in your hand and then go show them how this works? So all of you would have, you would have to have a feel for when you needed to do that. But I, I just wanted to put that right here at this point. So I mentioned limitations. Um, and I think this is an important part uh, when a originating site is modifying their bylaws. So in this case, I'm calling it ABC Hospital. Uh, in this case, one of, the, one of the limitations we place in, in the agreement is that the telehealth staff, meaning the LBHN uh, providers, shall only exercise privileges in telehealth as determined and requested by ABC Hospital or their medical staff. And so why do we do that? Well, this protects the, the remote hospital from 
our physicians being fully credentialed and privileged and having the ability to jump in a car and drive to that facility to provide similar services. Because once they're typically fully credentialed and privileged, uh, they can do those things. But in this case, we are seeking telehealth, telehealth privileges only, which will limit them to providing services electronically. They cannot go to the remote site to pay, or the originating site to provide those services. So that's an important protection for them. The bigger protection is that one of the limitations we place in this agreement is that the telehealth staff at Lehigh Valley Health Network shall not be eligible to admit, attend patients at ABC hospitals, or hold office, vote, nor serve on any medical staff uh, committees. This also protects the small uh, originating site. Uh, for instance, in some hospitals, if I were to credential our radiology staff alone to provide teleradiology services, if, I were, if they were doing full credentials and they were fully privileged and they had voting privileges and they could hold office, my radiology group might represent more than 50% of all the physicians at those small hospitals, uh, meaning that they would basically be the majority of the voters uh, on any medical staff issue at that small originating site. So by limiting uh, what our physicians can do at the smaller hospitals, it protects them uh, from basically the larger facility uh, controlling the medical staff at the smaller originating site. So an important limitation, and I, I know our small, our, our originating sites appreciate that. And based on those first two, one of the, one of the give backs we want uh, is that because they only have telehealth privileges, uh, they should not be required to attend a, the ABC hospital medical staff meetings or participate in specialty coverage. Uh, to do so would be detrimental to the program if the physicians had to attend these meetings on top of all the meetings they already attend at Lehigh Valley Health Network. So that's, that's a little give back uh, to Lehigh Valley Health Network, and I would strongly recommend it for you as well um, so that it makes it more tenable for your physicians to provide these services. And then finally, uh, remember, based I, I had mentioned, we do not assume responsibility for the patient. Uh, we don't really co-manage them. The final interpretation, reports, recommendations for treatment shall be the responsibility of the active staff members of ABC hospitals. And uh, so in that regard, we're not taking responsibility. Uh, we're limiting ourselves to a strict consultative model. So those are the four big limitations we put in our agreements uh, to protect basically the, the originating site in, a, in one way and Lehigh Valley Health Network in another. So let me talk a little bit about what's actually in the telehealth credentialing and privileging agreement itself. We, uh, the way we set our program up in terms of agreements with remote sites is we create a master telehealth agreement. And that master telehealth agreement has all of the legalese that you would find in any telehealth agreement, but it doesn't talk about any specific clinical service. What we do is then we add clinical services to the master agreement through a listing of uh, what we call schedules. So schedule A might be for telestroke, schedule B would be for teleinfectious disease. And those schedules would basically define how the clinical service is provided uh, and also tie it back to the master telehealth agreement. The credentialing and privileging agreement is separate from those and stands alone. And I think we did that, <clears throat> excuse me, based on the uh, requirements of CMS. So the first thing we do in our uh, agreement is make sure we tie this telehealth credentialing and privileging agreement to the same term and termination uh, language that is in the master agreement. So that if the master agreement ever goes away, the credentialing and privileging agreement goes away with it. Uh, then we move on and we talk about specifics. We, we stipulate that this process will operate under the CMS conditions of participation. We stipulate that our providers are active, credentialed, and privileged in the service in the specialty for the requested service. 
And again, once again, we reiterate that we will not assume, oh no, this is different. We, we will assume responsibility for the exchange of information after we receive a request for privileges from the remote site. And then we go further and we define how we release the information on our physicians to the remote site. Information such as licensure, CME hours, uh, the DEA information that's required, etc. We also define how we maintain our current listing of providers. And, and we do that because we have an active website that is, is probably modified on a daily basis. And we absolutely require the, origi the originating site to modify its medical staff bylaws to conform to the conditions of participation and agree to the limitations I went through a moment ago. And um, now that's something you're gonna have to think about individually in terms of where you may want to draw the line in terms of how willing you are uh, to push the uh, uh, delegated credentialing process. In our process, we simply are not going to basically provide telehealth services for any hospital that will not make this change. Um, this change is allowed by regulation, by law, it's recognized by the Joint Commission. We tend to, we tend to convince most hospitals to do this because it's in their best interest and it makes things a lot easier for them. However, you will find many hospitals that still have bylaws that will require change and we all know how much we like change. In the agreement, we also talk about termination of privileges. You know, physicians move around. Uh, they'll, they'll come to Lehigh Valley, they'll leave Lehigh Valley. Um, they may have a reduction in their privileges um, based on some negative outcome. Uh, at that point, it's our duty to let the remote site or the, origi the originating site know that we have reduced their privileges or terminated them so that they can also remove them from their medical staff as well. Uh, there's also confidentiality language, and then there's all the general language related to any contract, such as can you assign this contract to somebody else? What state is the governing law? Who receives the notices, et cetera, et cetera. And so that is basically the content of the privilege, of the credentialing and privileging agreement that we have with each site. And then, so we got, let's just pretend we've got that signed. The bylaws are changed. What happens next? Uh, actually, it is very simple. Uh, we have a request for privileges form that we give to the remote site or the originating site. I'm using those interchangeably. Uh, they drop their logo on these uh, on this request, and then basically um, they make a request to us for neurology, for infectious disease, for burn, for whatever service they want. And based on the fact that we've set up the credentialing, the delegated credentialing and privileging mechanism, we have reduced things to two pages, all right? And, for, and as you can see on the, that slide, there's only four signature blocks. Uh, and that basically is the process for requesting privileges at this point. And so let me take you through these forms real quick. On that request, the first page is basically around the physician's private information. Um, it talks about the privileges that will be requested. Again, that could be neurology, infectious disease, cardiology. And then the, the doc talks about their personal verification. Um, basically, it's a paragraph that says, I am on active staff with credentials and privileges to perform services in accordance with all laws and standards of TJC and CMS. Talks about the fact that they're licensed in could be Pennsylvania, could be multiple states. Talks about their DEA registration. Uh, the fact, it talks about their graduation from medical school, their residency, and CME credits. All the requirements we would have in Pennsylvania uh, for you to remain uh, licensed in the state and be active in a hospital. We also define how the re restrictions and reductions and privileges are reported to LVHN, so the remote site knows how that process occurs. Any restriction and reduction in privileges on our end are always reported to medical staff services. And those would then be conveyed to the remote site if there was a restriction or a reduction in those privileges. We also define how 
Credentials are subject to being audited by our medical staff services department. We confirm that professional liability insurance is in place and we have the physician sign that. I know you really can't read that, but I just went back a page. Uh, you can see the on the left side of your screen, that's it. That's the first page of this document. It's all about the, the physician who is seeking privileges and all of the information we keep to uh, assure the uh, the originating site that they are indeed uh, an active medical staff member of Lehigh Valley Health Network. <clears throat> the second page is simply a verification of all of that information. Uh, we verify that Dr. X is an active medical staff member, is privileged to provide all the services and the specialty of you name it. And then we have the physician signs that again. So the physician has signed page one, the physician has signed page two, that page is then signed by our senior VP of medical staff services. And then it's also signed by the chief medical officer or the VP of medical affairs at whatever hospital we're dealing with. So we have all of the signatures needed to move forward with privileging that doc. So that process is now out of the way. We've done all the paperwork, all two pages of it. Um, and if anybody wants to know how well that works in one day, we, we ran this process through 40 radiologists in about an hour and a half. We privileged and credentialed an entire group of uh, maternal fetal medicine specialists in, in a day because we only had the two pages to deal with to get the process started, made it real easy. So the next process that's a little bit hard for some people to understand, especially those that have been doing credentialing and privileging with 25 to 30 page packets uh, for 20 years, is that there's no more paperwork. There's no more 25 to 30 page packets of, of uh, paper that we're going to complete on every uh, physician. Instead, uh, we basically, and you can choose your own online tool. I think we use GoToMeeting. We allow the remote site to connect into our medical staff service office, and then we basically walk them through the physician files. So we connect to the originating site, and then we show all the provider information electronically. All of the same information that in the past we probably would have made copies of uh, and sent to the, small, uh, to the originating site. So now they have all of that information electronically to confirm that they have done this review of the credentials of the, of the Lehigh Valley Health Network providers. Once they do that, they're ready for the privileging process, which typically follows the same process as full credentialing. The docs at Lehigh Valley would be presented to the Medical Executive Committee and the Board of Trustees, and privileges are either granted or denied. So uh, it, the, the process works really, really well. Now, the lessons we've learned over the years, um, how many people like change? Uh, this is change, and uh, it takes time to change the medical staff bylaws. That does not get done quickly. Uh, so if that process is not already done, it will take some time to get done. And it also takes time for the medical staff office to adjust to the new process. Um, one of our first sites where we, we implemented this process we had the discussion, we had the demonstration, we were all ready to go, and the next thing I did was I received the 25 pages of information that needed to be filled out, and um, which I had to make a call, said no, that's not what we're doing anymore, and we had to walk through the process again. So sometimes change can be, a, 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 let's just say, a little taxing in terms of time. Um, I also will tell you that, the that not the distance site, I got this wrong, the originating site, um, or no, actually the, the originating site may request more information from the distance site um, that is beyond the two pages. For instance, some hospitals have confidentiality forms that need to be signed in order to have access to their data systems. So, you know, you're, you may not come out totally free and only, only do the two pager and then everything else is electronic, you may still have to do certain signatures uh, on certain forms that the uh, originating site has uh, beyond what is provided here. Um, I think the sooner you can provide the complete demonstration and, uh, and walkthrough of this process, the better, because when you see it, 
you get it. You know, talking about it is a little bit difficult to do, um, uh, but uh, when you do the demonstration, it, uh, it makes a difference because it's an, it's, you immediately get what we're trying to do. And I will tell you in the end, this process saves a ton of time, a lot of effort on both sides, and it's saving money in terms of, uh, of the process. If, you, if you'd like, what we do typically is because we, we've simplified this process so much and because the, the originating site wants a particular service of ours, uh, we require that all of this type of credentialing and privileging is done at no charge to Lehigh Valley Health Network. And uh, that's also something you'll have to negotiate with each hospital as you go forward as well because typically there are charges for credentialing and privileging. So I, that was short and sweet. I hope I wasn't too fast, but really I wanted to open this up to, to Q&A. Um, and for anybody that's never done one of these webinars, it's hard to sit in front of your monitor <laughs> and talk to your screen. Uh, so I, I hope I've been able to convey uh, what we've done at Lehigh Valley Health Network in this regard. So Kathy, how, how, do you, how would you like to handle Q&A? Yeah, so this is Kathy Weberly, and um, this is our first time using Zoom for this webinar. So just a, a brief um, overview of right now everyone is on mute. Um, so if you would like to ask questions, you will need to unmute yourself. Um, either that or send Becky a little note in the chat box saying please unmute me, and she can do that as well. Um, but go ahead and ask your question, and then um, if you can, then mute yourself back up so that we don't get a lot of um, background noise. So let's go ahead and take some questions. Hey, Joe, this is Denny Lorden. Can you hear me? Denny Lorden. I know you. Yeah, the How are you, buddy? Hey, I'm good. One of the things that we've run into in our network, uh, particularly with uh, respect to maintaining joint commission requirements, is communicating back to the sites on a regular basis. You know, whether you're taking feedback on if there's been any issues, whether or not they've acknowledged that they've received a monthly update that we sent them. Um, you know, how do we maintain a record that's acceptable to present to Joint Commission and what do they expect? So are you, are you asking how we communicate back with the sites in terms of the medical staff? Right, you know, it's, it's always difficult to know how educated someone like Joint Commission representatives are when they walk into your hospital and they start asking you about telemedicine and tele stroke, and then they start asking you to pull information or records or whatever it might be. So just to be on the cautious side, we're always trying to have good records of communications with our sites, but rarely do we get feedback that uh, there's issues or problems or anything like that. So it's kind of minimal, if you will, as far as information to present to them. Right. Uh, Denny, what, what we've done is, is, is a number of things. Um, one, we have that process in place where if somebody loses their privileges here, um, you know, uh, everybody's still there? <laughs> um, you know, we communicate who the physician whose, physician, uh, whose privileges have been revoked or reduced uh, to the remote site. Um, and, and it's interesting when the, when the joint commission shows up here for their every three year let's uh, let's check out Lehigh Valley Health Network. You know we will go into a meeting, closed door, uh, and we actually use the same electronic display of physician information to the joint commission surveyors in house uh, that we do to the the medical staff services folks at these originating sites. On top of that, if if the Joint Commission shows up at one of the originating sites and says, um, well, I'm not a physician, but we'll, we'll pretend I am uh, for the moment. If they say, I, I would like to see Dr. Tracy's files, what we'll do is the medical staff services department at the smaller hospital will call us, we'll do the, the go-to meeting type of thing, and we will walk them through that physician's file as if it existed at their own facility. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, based on all, based on what's allowed by by CMS and the Joint Commission. Okay. And, and, and for you, you remember the history. So, <laughs> did that did that answer your question? It did. Thank you. Yeah. 
Anybody else? Got a text that, is there a contact person we may send future questions to? Um, are you talking about contact for myself? My email, okay, I'll just read you my email if you didn't see it when it was on that last slide. It's joseph, J-O-S-E-P-H, dot Tracy, T-R-A-C-Y, at L-V-H-N dot org. And if I don't have the answer for you, I will shoot it over to my medical staff services department. And uh, I'm sure they would have an answer for you. Joe, that was Joe.Tracy at what? It was Joseph. I'm sorry. They would not let me use Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph.Tracy. Yeah. At LVHN, as in Lehigh Valley Health Network, dot org. I just put that in the chat. Um, I did also have a question from someone. Uh, could you please reiterate the difference between credentialing and privileging. That's a very uh, fine line there. Um, credentialing is pretty much the verification of all of the physician information that you would, you know, you would require in your consideration to add them to your medical staff. So you're reviewing their education, their background, you're looking at all the other places where they've been credentialed and privileged, you're looking for their DEA certifications, you're just looking for a host of information that is required uh, by, uh, by your hospital. And uh, so once you have that information, you know, it, it is then reviewed. And then based on that review, you are either granted or denied privileges at the hospital. So they could, they could review my credentials and say, there's no way I'm adding Tracy to my medical staff. He just has, there's just something in his file that doesn't add up. Or they could see that I had a sterile, stellar background and say, yeah, we, we want to add uh, Dr. Tracy to our medical staff, and they would award privileges. So based on credential, the credentials alone are just your file, what you've done, where you've been, how you've done it, and then the privileges are what give you the ability to work in the hospital to do your specialty, so to speak. I yeah, hope that answered it. No, there's a question in the chat box. Um, oh, okay. Ah, Mike from, can you talk more about some of the challenges you've had working with medical staff credentialing department? Yeah. Um, Mike, uh, the, the challenges that I, I have faced, I've, I've had hospitals change their bylaws in a month. And then I've had hospitals who have refused to change their bylaws um, for, for more than one or two years. And, and that typically doesn't go very well. And um, the one hospital that did make that decision years ago has now changed their bylaws to accommodate the, condi the telehealth conditions of participation under CMS. So everybody so far, you know, sometimes it's a real quick process. Uh, sometimes it's a long process, and a lot of it has to do with personalities and politics uh, of, of the uh, medical executive committee or board of trustees. Uh, you know, again, this has changed, and sometimes change is a little foreign, and they want to stick with what they know, what they have. It's kind of our jobs to convince them that this is easier uh, to do. It's for their benefit in terms of receiving services they don't typically offer at their hospitals. So uh, hopefully that answer, and Mike, let me know if that answers your question. Uh, I have another question that says, can you send us your slides? Let me see, how much should I charge for that? Uh, <laughs> I, I typically, I will only send my slides out in a PDF format. Um, I do not send my slides out in, uh, in native PowerPoint. That way, if you copy them and make your own presentation, at least you have to retype them. Um, so, uh, and that's why I do it. Um, 
the slides should be also available on the PDF version will be made available on the TRC national TRC website. Um, once we get the video link up as well. Okay. So Kathy, you're going to create a PDF of these slides. Yes. Okay. Very good. And you do have another question in the chat box. It says, how do you manage FPPE and OPPE with spoke hospitals? Um, that would be a question. If you will email me off float to my medical staff services office. And then they will, I'll get a response back to you. Oh, they, I, I failed to address, there is a very similar but slightly different process for um, uh, critical access hospitals, but it, it pretty much follows the, uh, the rules for, uh, for larger hospitals. But because they're separate, they had to write it twice. <laughs> okay, got another. Uh, are there templates we can refer to for the agreements? Um, uh, I would have to get the permission of our, our attorneys to share uh, share that information. Um, the one template I, I could provide might be uh, what did I call it? Back through my notes would kind of be the model language for developing this the category. I could probably share that. But again, you have to remember that the way we treat telehealth hospital to hospital is that we are true co consultants. So the model language basically is related to that. If, you're, if you are providing services to a hospital where your physicians are assuming direct care, uh, you, would have, you, you would have a very different type of limitation slash model language. All right. Um, are there any differences if you are dealing with a child or adult patients? Uh, not, in, not in terms of the credentialing and privileging aspect. Um, the pediatricians would have to go through the same rigor uh, of credentialing and privileging uh, that, uh, that any other specialty or primary care practice would have to go through. Other questions? I've got um, just a couple of short survey questions that uh, we like to do to get feedback from the group. What I'm going to do is post the questions in the chat box and then folks can respond that way. So the first question is how valuable was the meeting today. And I don't Maybe think I should disappear at this point. <laughs> and it's on a scale of one to five. So as you get, um, you should be able to click on that hyperlink and it should take you out and you can comment on that. And then our second question is, oh, it didn't hyperlink. Okay, I'll try it again next time. Um, did you learn anything new to it? I don't think the hyperlink is working. I don't know if anyone else is having a problem yeah, with it or not. It's doing some weird stuff to me. You can copy and paste it. There, now I it. Yep, that's it. And then our last question today. Okay. If you uh, what you learned today, is it applicable to your work? Mm -hmm. Have 
three different things. How do we get back to the first question, though? When um, um, when the link was available, I clicked on it and it went to. I can do that one again. And while Becky's doing that, Joe, if you want to flip back to the slide deck, um, then we'll do the three closing slides. So as you know, this presentation has been part of the National Telehealth Resource Center webinar series. Um, and the next uh, webinar is going to be uh, presented by the South Central Telehealth Resource Center, and the topic is Calming a Nervous System, Managing Rural Spinal Cord and Brain Injury Patients Through Technology, and that will be on Thursday, June 18th, 2015. Thanks, Matt. We'll see you when I get back, all right? If I get back. And for those of you who are not able to participate online, like if you're on the phone, um, you can also participate in a brief perception slide of the slide deck, and we will make that available to you on the National TRC website. And if there are no further questions, um, we will go ahead and wrap up today's webinar. Thank you all for participation. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, guys.